My name is Lawrence Galata, and I'm the chief of the shoulder and elbow division of the Sports Medicine Institute at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Today, we're going to be presenting a case of a revision rotator cuff repair. Our patient is a 53-year-old right-hand dominant man who injured his shoulder three months prior to presentation, uh, injuring his rotator cuff. He had previously undergone a rotator cuff repair in 2005 with good result and was doing well until his most recent injury. On physical examination, his range of motion was preserved, but he did have weakness with empty can job testing to test the supraspinatus. His MRI on the fluid-sensitive coronal images on the right shows a re-rupture of the supraspinatus. There is artifact from the previous anchors that you could see at the greater tuberosity, and you can see retraction of the supraspinatus tendon to the middle of the humeral head. But as is typical in re-ruptures of previously repaired rotator cuff tendons, you can see that the tendon is very thin and atrophic. However, when you look at the proton density parasagittal images on the right, you notice that the muscle quality is still preserved in that there is no fatty infiltration. Therefore, our surgical plan is to proceed with a right revision rotator cuff repair with a double row construct using dermis on demand allograft biologic augmentation. Biologic augmentation has been shown to be useful, particularly in revision settings or in patients with biologically challenged environments in which healing rates have been shown to be lower than in primary cases or patients without medical comorbidities. The main barrier to using patch augmentation or biologic augmentation has been the technical difficulty in placing the product. Dermis on demand allograft is a freeze dried human dermal allograft pledge it with a central channel bored out such that the suture can be shuttled through the center of the implant. This allows the surgeon to provide biologic augmentation of rotator cuff repairs in 30 seconds or less. We begin the procedure by establishing a standard posterior portal. This is the view inside the joint. Looking towards anterior, the subscapularis is normal. Long head of the biceps tendon is normal. And if you forward flex and externally rotate the arm, you can see a good view of the re-rupture of the supraspinatus. Moving around back, infraspinatus and teres minor are okay. We establish a rotator interval anterior portal. This is just lateral to the coracoid and is placed between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis. We place a cannula to establish that, that portal to aid in instrumentation of the joint. Long head of the biceps tendon has some tenosynovitis, but is otherwise intact, and therefore we will not perform a concomitant biceps tenodesis. Patient does have some chondral wear of both the glenoid and the humeral head. I establish an anterolateral portal using spinal needle localization directly over the rotator cuff tear site. Any remaining wisps of fibers are released with sharp dissection. A 4.0 shaver is then inserted through that portal and debridement of the footprint takes place. One can see where the previous sutures were placed from previous rotator cuff repair. Next, I insert an electric cautery device in order to remove any of the fibrocartilage at the rotator cuff insertion site to get down to native bone. After having done that, the shaver is then reintroduced and the greater tuberosity is decorticated. Now looking in the subacromial space, we can see the undersurface of the acromion superiorly. Through the anterolateral portal, a shaver is inserted and a bursectomy takes place. And then using electric cautery, the CA ligament is removed from the undersurface of the acromion. I start by exposing the anterolateral edge of the acromion, and then knowing everything medial to that and posterior to that is tissue that needs to be debrided, and therefore this aids in the speed of the debridement. A 5-5 shaver is now used to perform our acromioplasty. The depth is set at approximately one shaver width. This patient had had a previous acromioplasty at the time of his previous surgery, and therefore a more minimal acromioplasty uh, was performed in this case. After adequate acromioplasty, the arthroscope is then inserted into the anterolateral portal to ensure that there's been adequate resection of the subacromial spur. Since that portal site was established directly over the tear, 
I simply turn my eyes south and see the tear. You could see the degenerative tissue and we could see where the previous sutures are from the uh, rotator cuff repair. I then establish a posterior or lateral portal, which is going to be largely for, used for viewing. One can see that the tissue here appears to be avascular. It is also thin, as is typical with recurrent ruptures of rotator cuff tears that have already been repaired. This is using a grasper to see the tear configuration. Does not necessarily follow any classification, but you can notice that it is degenerative and acting most consistent with an L-shaped tear. Now we're going to place the anchor. This is the medial row anchor, and this is placed through a percutaneous puncture on the lateral aspect of the acromion. This allows a proper trajectory of the so-called dead man's angle of this anchor. It also allows for suture management as we proceed with the rotator cuff repair. Notice I'm still viewing through the anterolateral portal, and this gives excellent visualization of exactly where this anchor is being placed relative to the articular surface and also relative to the footprint. This gentleman's bone is relatively hard, and therefore after the punch or the awl is used, uh, next the uh, tap is used and then an anchor is placed. This is a triple loaded anchor. Care is taken to ensure that it is by the subchondral bone but does not violate the articular surface. Using this visualization, uh, one can make sure that that is the case. Once the anchor is placed, I then switch my camera into the posterior or lateral portal. In this case, some external rotation of the arm can bring the surgical field into view. The lateral gutter bursa is then debrided. This is a 4.0 shaver. And a twist in working cannula is placed. This is an 8.5 millimeter in diameter can uh, cannula. We then start passing the sutures. The sutures are passed from anterior to posterior. That is my typical workflow. This is a self-suturing device. I find it helpful to sweep the other sutures posteriorly. Care is taken to ensure that we are above the long head of the biceps tendon and not incarcerating that into the repair. And the depth here is about the length of the suturing device. The surgeon must take caution when deploying the needle for the suturing device such that the needle does not hit the acromion superiorly if that is the case, the needle can break and then needs to be retrieved out of the joint. We're going to do mattress sutures and work our way from anterior to posterior. Again, care is taken to ensure we are avoiding the long head of the biceps tendon. Grabbing what appears to be adequate tissue of the remnant of the supraspinatus and trying to space are passes of at least a centimeter. I like to alternate colors. So the triple loaded anchors have two anchors, which are white or some form of white, and they have one that's blue. So we've passed the all white sutures anteriorly. The middle set of sutures will be the blue, and then the posterior set of sutures will be the tiger striped white and black sutures. You can see having these sutures out of that percutaneous portal, just lateral to the acromion, allows us to get those out of the way. It's also important that if you're passing the sutures from anterior to posterior, as we are doing here, that we are then retrieving through the anterior portal, as you see right here. So therefore, we are working away from how we're passing. If we're passing from anterior to posterior, then we're retrieving out of the anterior portal. This allows the sutures that have already been passed to be out of the way so that we do not have any tangling.
in terms of sutures that are left from the previous rotator cuff repair, if they are loose, they are removed. But as you see, there is still some remnants of the suture in the supraspinatus there that I did not remove because removing so would also require removing valuable tissue. All three mattresses have been passed. And now we are going to tie. I do like to tie my medial row. This is simply a preference for other surgeons who do not tie the medial row. And I think that's perfectly acceptable. But when we tie these mattresses, we're going to tie from posterior to anterior. So we passed from anterior to posterior, and now we're going to tie from posterior to anterior. I use a simple surgeon's knot, making sure that the suture is able to slide within the anchor, and then back it up with half hitches. After the knot is tied, I then dock the tied sutures back out of that percutaneous portal just lateral to the acromion. I will change my post of either the anterior or posterior limb, depending on how the knots will sit. I try to have each knot equidistant from each other. So sometimes that will require the post being on the posterior limb of the suture, and sometimes it'll require it being on the anterior limb of the suture. Or again, surgeon knot, backing it up with half hitches, making sure to pass point each way. Do you think it's important to follow general arthroscopic non-tying principles in terms of getting loop security, that is cinching the sliding knot such that the tissue is reapproximated back to the bone, but then also getting knot security? So here we've tied all three knots, and what I'm doing is I'm just planning how I'm going to place my dermis on demand. So dermis on demand is human dermal allograft. Uh, it has been freeze dried. Once placed into the arthroscopic fluid environment, it rehydrates and thaws. And as you can see here, there is a shuttle wire that's been placed through a channel that's been bored through the center of this dermal allograft pledget. There's another look at it. These are relatively simple to use. A knot pusher is then used to push the allograph pledget so that it's flush with that medial row knot. Taking care to make sure that we are spacing these out appropriately. So one limb from the middle suture will now be used to place a second dermis on demand allograft. Given the revision setting and given the fact that the MRI and intraoperative findings were consistent with a thin tendon, uh, it was deemed that biologic augmentation would give this patient the best chance of healing following the surgery. Again, the suture is placed through the central channel. Knot pusher is placed. And the dermal allograft is placed. The free suture of the posterior su knot, the free suture of the posterior knot is then retrieved. And this is loaded up into a knotless anchor, which will be placed as a lateral row. The first one placed is going to be on the anterior aspect of the proximal humerus, just lateral to the footprint. What's happened here is that as we are placing the lateral row anchor, the allograft has moved more laterally and it is no longer over the repair tissue site. And therefore, quite simply, it's pushed back into place using the anchor to push it. 
it's now pushed back to that knot and repositioned and placed directly over the repair site. The lateral row anchor can then be placed into the pilot hole, which has already been created with the awl. The sutures are tensioned. And the anchor is placed. Oftentimes this lateral row bone is osteoporotic. And that is one of the rationales behind me, behind why I like to tie the medial row. One limb from the posterior most suture is now used for a third dermis on demand allograft. Again, placed with a knot pusher against the medial row knot. And then the remaining limbs from the anterior and the middle sutures are then retrieved. And then all three of these sutures are going to be placed into another lateral row anchor, which is going to be placed on the posterior aspect of the proximal humerus. One can gauge the tension of the repair, as well as the placement of the allografts before final deployment of the anchor. This is the final construct looking through the anterolateral portal. There have been a total of three dermis on demand allografts. There's one triple loaded medial row anchor. Mattress sutures were placed through the tendon. Bef those mattress sutures were then tied. And before loading those into a lateral row anchor, the dermis on demand allograft was shuttled down the suture. The sutures are then loaded into the lateral row anchor and deployed. This provided an excellent revision rotator cuff repair with biologic augmentation. Here you can see what the closure looks like. These are dissolvable sutures. Then fiber and glue is used to help hold the suture sites together. Thank you for your time and watching this video on arthroscopic revision rotator cuff repair using dermis on demand allograft.